welcome to this special uh, pre-recorded uh, Game Republic event today, sponsored by Red Kite Games. And we're pleased to have uh, two speakers today. Simon Ivanisak, CEO of Red Kite Games, based in Leeds. And uh, we have Simon Smith as well, Senior Game Scout at Team 17, obviously based in Wakefield. First up, though, we have Simon Ivanisak, uh, Red Kite Games. So I'm going to hand you over to Simon and then we'll come back at the end uh, for a few questions. So over to you, Simon. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening to me talk today. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about Red Kite, who we are, what we do, and why we're a great, great place to, to build a career and, and, and make video games. Um, also, uh, Red Kite are very much hiring. And hopefully this presentation will help to encourage you to apply. So Red Kite were established in 2012. Um, we have a team size of around 60 developers and, and we're growing month on month. Um, we're based in central Leeds, just three minute walk from the train station. And um, we've set up home in the beautiful grade two listed Park Row house, um, which is uh, that building that you can see um, in the background image. Um, at Red Kite, we consider ourselves technology focused, but creatively accomplished. And the main reason for that is that um, we have, in terms of our team breakdown, we're roughly 75% engineers, 25% art, design and production. Um, so what we do at Red Kite, we primarily we provide work for higher code development and development of own IT. And we've built a reputation for delivering a high quality service, creating AAA PC console games across varying genres some of which you'll um, see later on in the presentation. We're now part of the Sumo Digital family of studios. And at the moment, we're supporting multiple world-class AAA publishing partners on current gen and new gen projects. And we're a team-focused, award-winning studio. Um, you can see on the right there, uh, we with the Best Places to Work badge and also winning the Best Small Company for 2020, the Tiga Star Award, and of course, the, the Best uh, Companies Three Star uh, award there as well. A little bit about our history. Um, so the majority of the Red Kite team, we've been making games together our entire career. It's, um, it's, it's very much the spine of the studio have pretty much never not made a game together. And you can see there, you know, we've had the privilege to work on some huge franchises such as GTA, Red Dead and LBP. Red Kite's vision. So we want to grow and improve in every way. So that's the team, expertise, studio culture. Um, we're always trying to, 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 to be better at Red Kite. Um, we're technology focused. We like to keep on the pulse, plus it's always fun to play with the new toys and, and new platforms and hardware. We multi-project, multi-genre and AAA. We like working on lots of different types of big games. And we like to have multiple projects on the go at the studio. We consider ourselves open world specialists and certainly play to our strengths in that area. And we're very much specialised in co-development and continuing to work with good people on great games. Excitingly, we're also starting to think about creating original IP. And this is very much an active ambition at Red Kite and a prospect that we hope excites any person looking to join the studio. And of course, we want to enhance Red Kite's reputation as a leading games developer and to be considered the game studio to build a career out in Yorkshire and the north of England. So let's take a look at some of the games that we've helped to make. As you can see, Red Kite isn't a one genre game studio. We've worked on action games, open world games, racing games, first person, third person, but you can see all high profile and lots of different art styles. One of the coolest opportunities when working at Red Kite is the diversity of projects present within the studio. It's fair to say that it's certainly never boring and we constantly find ourselves pushing the boundaries when it comes to gameplay that we're creating or the technologies that we're engineering. We're extremely proud to be a highly successful multi-genre AAA development studio. So looking at a couple of our most latest uh, games that we've worked on, so the Mafia Trilogy, uh, working with 2K in San Francisco and Hangar 13 down in Brighton, um, we, were the re we were the lead developer on Mafia 3 Definitive Edition and also provided co-development support for Mafia Definitive Edition. So this was quite a big project for the team, especially working across two, two games and, and across the, the, the Mafia code base. But the Red Kite team 
um, throughout that time, we worked on so many different areas on both games that it would be impossible to, to list what we what we did really. But what I would describe it as is, is, is best described as remastering across multiple platforms. So Two Point Hospital, um, working with Sega and the super talented team at Two Point Studios. Again, Red Kite was the lead developer in bringing Two Point Hospital to the Switch, PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, this is a project that we've, we're very, very proud of at Red Kite. The Red Kite team did a fantastic job porting you know, this much loved PC management sim with the console version, just like the original being met with critical acclaim. What was nice was, you know, once the game was released and was out there in the wild, was, was reading reviews and reading kind of comments from the community of, of Two Point Hospital talking about how much they love the Switch version and how, how many of them feel that it's actually the definitive version of the game being able to take it on the road. And Battletoads, quite a different um, project to the likes of um, Two Point or, or Mafia. But still, this was just back to fun. Um, working with Rare and the highly creative Galala Studios, Red Kite provided co-development support in bringing Battletoads to PC. And we also did some console support as well. As I said, it was a very fun project to work on. And it's been great to see the fans, both old and new, enjoying this much loved franchise. What games do we have in development? So as to be expected, there's not a huge amount that I can tell you about the games that we're working on, but here's what I can tell you. So we're helping to develop two AAA open world action games for current gen and new gen platforms. We're porting a hugely successful AAA Battle Royale game to multiple console platforms. And we're porting one high profile AAA action game to a new gen streaming platform. And we're working in um, Unreal, Unity, and custom engines across all major platforms. And of course, if you're coming for an interview and you sign an NDA, We'll happily tell you a lot more. So a little bit about Red Kite Studio culture. So nurturing Red Kite Studio culture is at the heart of everything we do. Um, we have no egos. We have a zero crunch mentality. Um, we adopt flexi time, including the, um, the ability to finish early on Fridays. We give 27 days holiday. Um, the reason why the plus is there is because with continued service, that goes up to 31 days. So, you know, a, a very good um, holiday allowance there, including your birthday off, duvet days and Christmas Eve. And we've just introduced a new uh, YouTube's benefits platform across Red Kai and the Sumo Group, um, where essentially it's down to you what benefits you want. Um, you can pick and choose the benefits that are important to you and you can change them as your circumstances change and your life change as you build your career at Red Kai. So things as you would expect, uh, there's an annual bonus scheme, life assurance, income protection, dental insurance, but there's much, much more. We also um, are very focused on learning and development. We give every, uh, every team member at Red Kai, on top of their holidays, five learning and development days, um, which, you know, this is to be done so that, um, to help with personal and professional development. So these, these days can be used you know, there might be some Udemy tutorials that you like that you'd like to do, or maybe it's GDC Vol, or there's you know some tutorials on the web, or maybe you want to attend an event. All these things can be used to you can use your learning days for. But what's also cool is that one of those learning days can be to nothing to do with your job or or, or what you do for Red Kite. If you want to go and volunteer or do some charity work, or maybe do something for special effects, for example, then you can use one of those days to give something back. We're also focused on health and well-being and have employee assistance programs in there and um, focused again on equality, diversity, inclusion. And what's important here is that these initiatives, we have employee-led steering groups. Uh, something I always like to mention at Red Kite, because again, it's something we're very proud of, is, is our staff retention. It's very rare that people leave Red Kite. And in the 10 years that the studio has been going, our staff retention has never dropped below 95%, which is a really good indicator that people enjoy what they're doing at Red Kite. And to summarize, you know, a place to make great games in a fun and rewarding studio with a lovely bunch of talented people. And just as a little joke there, you know, don't join Red Kite if you don't want to make friends. So this information, you probably might be quite familiar to, to some of the people watching this, but I'll, I'll um, go through it anyway, because Leeds is just a, a great place to call home. So, you know, where Red Kite is based, 
with a vibrant social scene, leads to some of the best bars and restaurants that the north of England has to offer. We were only 20 minutes from the stunning Yorkshire Moors and Bronte country. And within 90 minutes, you're also within easy reach of the beautiful beaches of Whitby and, and, and Runswick Bay. So, you know, the area in Yorkshire and Leeds, whether you enjoy the city living or the tranquility of open spaces, or indeed a mixture of both, you know, Leeds is a fantastic place to call home. So what can I tell you about the Red Kite family? So we, we're a friendly bunch and we, we love spending time together. This team photo is taken at our annual summer barbecue, which sees the Red Kite family get together for, for three days of fun, food, games and laughter. And um, we're really, really hopeful and it's looking very, very positive that we're going to be able to have the Red Kite summer barbecue this year. Um, because obviously due to COVID, we've, we've missed out on a couple, which has been a shame. The barbecue is certainly one of the many social highlights of the, of the year, but it's matched only by Red Kite's epic holiday Christmas party. And also Red Kite is, a, is, you know, we're a proud supporter of the Games Charity Special Effects, of which I'm an ambassador for. And we actively take part in a wide variety of fundraising events. You can see there where Nick and the team visited when we'd moved into the new studio and the, the photo below where we took part in the um, five aside at, at Wembley for, in, in aid of special effects. So it'd be great if we didn't have to talk about COVID-19 and although the vaccination effort has been monumental, it still can't be ignored. Um, what is good is, you know, at Red Kite, we're continuing to make games and we're continuing to hire. We've released four different games whilst we've been in lockdown, um, which has been a great achievement for the team. Um, obviously, there's been a slight move to, to more emphasis on physical and mental well-being. A good way that I like to look at it is, you know, it's about working from home and not living at work. But the fun hasn't stopped. We've got the Red Kite Cafe and the Red Kite Inn, um, virtual team um, groups where the team can jump in at any point. You know, they're available 24-7 if they want to have a cuppa or a drink um, and just, you know, spend some, some time together and have that, that, that social interaction. Um, you know, throughout lockdowns and, 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 and the pandemic, obviously the guys have been getting together playing online games. We have, you know, board game nights through Tabletop Simulator. We've had pizza nights, murder mystery nights. And, um, you know, the, the team have been uh, a little bit spoiled, I think, with um, the, the variety and, and the amount of care package that, that they've been sent, um, keeping them, you know, well fed and watered and um, looked after during what's um, obviously been a, a challenging time. I think something to say as well, you know, depending on when you do potentially join Red Kite, is it possible that you'll be working from home to start with? Obviously, anything that you would need to do your job will be provided. Um, you know, the Red Kite team, you know, we plan to fully return to the studio once it's safe, can be considered a fun working social environment again, and it's worth the effort to do so. So that is very much our intention as, as, as a team at the studio. And, you know, we're hopeful that this can happen towards the end of the year. So in what's, you know, clearly unprecedented and challenging times for everyone due to COVID-19, you know, Red Kite remains committed to hiring the best and brightest developers that our wonderful industry has to offer. So thank you for, for listening. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight and a flavor into Red Kite kind of work we do and, and, and what we're up to and yeah we look forward to hopefully seeing you apply great stuff thank you simon uh lovely presentation there and uh, really positive um i think uh, it's funny i, I was um at a, a dit online event uh, the other week and uh i was mentioning you because we were talking about uh companies that we'd taken out to the game developer conference in san francisco and i remember many years ago i think it was around 2012 2013 when you just left i think um, rockstar leeds and you'd set up red kite and you came out to gdc and i think there was only at the time maybe three or four people in in red kite um yeah. at that at that point and it's just wonderful to see the the journey that's happened you know with, with where you are now where you know you have more than 60 people working for you in in, in leeds and you're part of the sumo group and it's just, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's just fantastic to see the kind of journey that you've been on, really. Yeah, definitely, Jamie. Um, you know, I think 
when I decided to, to start a games company, you know, where we are now, I'm so grateful for what we have achieved. And, you know, I, even back then, um, I probably wouldn't have thought if, if you'd kind of said that to me back then that that's where we would be. Um, so that, that's great. But, you know, it, so much is down to the, to, to the team and support. And, and, and also, you know, um, I think some credit has to go to the development scene in and around Yorkshire as well. We're such a supportive bunch of studios. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's, that's always been great with, you know, new people coming in who, who have an idea or new people coming in wanting to start businesses. And um, all we ever do is try and help, um, whether, whether it, you know, succeeds or not. But I think that's really a, a testament to everybody because even with the successes and the failures is that generally the people are still in the areas. They just either now working at Red Kite or they're working at another studio, C17 or Rockstar or, you know, the, the many other great studios that we have in Yorkshire. So, uh, but yeah, it's been it's been a great journey, and you know I remember, um, you know, meeting up with you. It was a couple of weeks after I'd, I'd, I'd set up the studio, meeting you in Leeds in, in a Starbucks, and us, you know, <laughs> frantically trying to fill out the paperwork so I could get out to the GDC <laughs> because you know all the applications had pretty much gone in by then, and you know you managed to um, sneak my application in and get it okayed, and you know. Um, you know, and then going out to GDC and experiencing it and then coming back and it really just, you know, um, I went out to GDC with very little to show or very little to, to say really, but, you know, meeting people and then coming back just then meant that there was some momentum and like, yeah, I'm excited to, to be doing this. I feel like I'm, I'm doing something that I really want to. So it was a, a very big positive at such an early stage. And, you know, it's one of the best things I think about Game Republic and, and the ability to to help individuals and studios and startups that that are back in you know in that situation like I was. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. It's nice nice of you to say so. I think we are very blessed here in the region. We have a you know wonderful um, array of companies, all different shapes and sizes, and uh, it's just it's just nice. You know, I think when we can get back to you know doing events and we're, you know we've got this event. Uh, where we're meeting up for the first time in 16 months and um, it's just it'll be nice to get back to that but even in you know like you say in these times where everything's been online um, it's been it's been great to kind of interact with companies and and help people in in quite a difficult time but everyone's been been brilliant and being able to still continue to do their jobs and make great games and actually something that I saw on on, on there as well which I, I think has changed a lot since we first went out to GDC and that's all the you know, your emphasis on like no crunch and kind of mental health and sort of diversity of the industry, which was, you know, I mean, it was talked about at that time, but it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't really sort of part of the zeitgeist. It wasn't really what companies were doing at the time. And that just shows, I think, how far we've, we've come on as an industry as well, haven't we? Yeah, definitely. And I think, again, you know, specifically talking about Red Kite, because, you know, that's where my experience lies is that, I think a lot of those those subjects that we're talking about, which are really important, is you know they, they become increasingly more important with the maturity of your studio as well, and just how you want to present and, mm. and what's you know um, the, the way you you want to go about things. And you know something I will say on a lot of those sides is you know becoming part of the Sumo Group and and the support that they've given um, has mm. been great in respect to that and and helping um, you know shape that side of red kite and how we want to represent ourselves and and help on the um you know when, when it comes to recruitment and, and all these different elements is you know that they've been they've been fantastic but you know i do think that um for, for the most part um you know, these, these i think we've made strides in those areas you know these, mm. there's obviously mm. been occasions where these um that that hasn't been the case over over the last couple few years um but i think that um for me the majority of studios out there are you know they care about it a hell of a lot more than they used to and i think that's a good thing yeah yeah definitely because you know your your employees the people that you work with day to day the you know friends and colleagues and you want to keep them you don't want to see them burning out you don't want to see them you know in in distress because of you know any issues that they have or whatever and you know that and and it, it's good to hear that you have a very low kind of churn of, of, of people in the company and 
yeah, I mean, it's it's just um, a, a good kind of positive story, really. Yeah, and also it isn't difficult. You know, just <laughs> you, you should treat people the way you should treat them, and they'll treat you the same. <laughs> it's not really, <laughs> it's not that difficult, really. Um, but certainly in my in my mind, um, anyway. Maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but um, <laughs> you know, if if you look after the team you're going to build a good team and you're going to build a team that stays. Um, yeah. And a team that stays together, you know, every game that they ship, every project they work on, every year that they spend together, um, you know, they're building friendships, they're making great games. Um, you know, what What more can, you know, it's pretty much the definition of a team for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant, Simon. Well, um, if you kindly close down um, the presentation, I think we'll, um, we'll, we'll draw it to a close there. That's brilliant. But... Um, uh, lovely of you to uh, to join us today and for sponsoring uh, the event as well. And uh, it's nice of you to big up Leeds as well. Obviously, fantastic city and a wonderful football club as well. So it's great of you to, to kind of uh, to to back us there. That's brilliant. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to point out you have got a Lego uh, Manchester United ground in the in the in the background there. Yeah, you? I have. Yeah. <laughs> good stuff Simon thanks very much for joining today that was brilliant thanks Jamie see you mate thank you uh, fantastic so that was uh, Simon Ivanasak there uh, CEO of Red Kite Games um, we're now going to hear from uh, Simon Smith uh, Senior Game Scout at Team 17 so uh, hello Simon hi Jamie how's it going yeah good thanks mate how are you I'm alright a bit warm today which yeah, is it sun, sunny in Manchester, not raining? Uh, it's 30 degrees, which is obviously, <laughs> which is obviously <laughs> the date and time when we've done this recording. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. Uh, we talked to Simon, he, was, um, he had a Lego Manchester United um, ground behind him. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but um, I don't know if you've got anything in, in your real background that uh, can compete with that. I've got actual Manchester. You can probably see Old Trafford. <laughs> Old Trafford is probably kind of like over here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, mate. Well, thanks for uh, coming along today. And you're going to talk about um, pitching your game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going to do 17 tips for pitching your game. Good stuff, mate. Well, I, I might chip in um, along the way, but um, yeah, carry on. No problem. Well, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, Team 17 is where I work and I'm doing 17 tips for pitching your game. Um, so just a little bit about me to start off with. So my name's Simon Smith. I'm a senior game scout at Team 17. And my job is to find, source, sign new games for our indie games label. Uh, from all around the world, I work with every different country possible really. Um, so my background is I started in the games industry in 1999, um, did a degree in film studies before that because there weren't any games degrees available at the time and I wasn't really interested in programming and, and art in order to be a games designer. So I did a degree in film studies, which is great, just gave me a degree and um, it actually helped me get my first job at Codemasters because at the time they were only employing people that had degrees. It kind of didn't matter what degree you had as long as you had one. <laughs> um, so I got a job as Codemasters on, um, as a level designer. So it's a junior job, but it's a good way into the industry. And level designer, it was on Colin McRae Rally. So I was a track, it's Colin McRae Rally 2, should I say. And I was a track designer on uh, Colin McRae Rally 2. Uh, and then my second game was Operation Flashpoint Cold War Crisis where I was a uh, lead level designer for Codemasters and we did work in turn with Codemasters on that. Uh, then I worked at Blitz Games, did loads of licensed games, everything from Barbie to Bad Boys to Reservoir Dogs. At one point I was simultaneously working on Barbie and Reservoir Dogs, so that's a good claim to fame. Um, uh, after five years at Blitz, moved to Sony, worked as an external producer for a couple of years, um, got made redundant, as you do in the games industry sometimes. Uh, moved on and did a bit of time at uh, Reloaded Productions in Edinburgh, working on APB Reloaded, uh, did some VR work at Studio Liddell, uh, in between doing sort of my own company stuff. My own company uh, is Thumb Food, uh, which I've had going since 2014. I did uh, some games for clients, including Manchester City Football Club, and made a game for Playlink, an original game that, uh, we invented called 
Word Hunters, which is one of the second wave performance games, which was uh, a word compendium of word games for the PlayStation. Uh, and late last year, I saw that um, Team 17 were advertising jobs for Game Scout. I just thought that's a dream job. And it's, it's very tiring running your own company. And, uh, you know, you ha I got to a position where I had to do more with my own company than move it to do something else. So I took this opportunity to speak to Team 17. And, uh, yeah, they gave me a job in February. And it's been great, really good. Get to speak to developers all around the world. Basically get to be nice to developers all day. So um, that's quite a long description. But, yeah, I get to be nice to developers all day, except when I'm not nice to developers. And when I'm not nice is just basically saying, we love your game, but we don't think the commercial side is going to stack up for us, which happens. You know, we're here to make money. We're a friend of the Indies, but we're still a commercial company, and everyone needs to make money. We've all got to eat. Right, so on with the show. Uh, yeah, so just a quick little bit about Team 17 as well. So Team 17, founded in 1990, uh, it's based in Wakefield with a commercial office in Nottingham. And then recently, 2019, Team 17 bought EP Entertainment in Salford, Greater Manchester, and that's become Team 17 Manchester. Even though it's actually in Salford, but we're not split hairs. Um, and the company's grown. We've got over 300 Teamsters. Teamsters is what we call the people working for the company. And week before last, uh, we bought a company called Story Toys in Dublin. So that's a nice addition to the Team 17 group, which is growing. Uh, and Story Tours, Toys make licensed apps for kids, so things like Disney characters and Very Hungry Caterpillar and stuff like that. Um, if you don't know about Team 17 games, then get out from under your rock and uh, have a look on the website. Worms, Overcooked, Blasphemous, Moving Out, Hell at Loose, The Survivalist, My Time at 40, A Hammer Team, Golf With Your Friends, lots more. I think we've released over 160 games in a 31 year history. Uh, submit game, that's very important. If you want to submit a game, just go to the website, team17.com forward slash submit game. And if you put your game in there, it goes directly into our green light process. And we will look at it very, very quickly. We will uh, get back to you at least, um, at least we'll get back to you with a no quickly if it's a definite no. If it's a maybe, it might take a little bit longer because we have a list of games to go through. But yeah, everyone's games get seen very quickly at Team 17. If you put your game into that game submission system, it instantly gets sent around the entire game scouting team and everyone sees your game. So it's a very strong and robust green light process. And you get a lot of feedback. Right, on with the talk, because I've been talking too long. Uh, so here you go, 17 tips for pitching your game. Just set off my timer so I know how much time I'm taking. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, through, going to go through 17 tips. There's a little bit of structure to it, but not much. And just some tips that I've come up with over the years. I've been tweeting about these as well. I've tweeted a few already, and I'm going to add these tweets, these tips. So you're getting an advanced preview of all my tweets. And there'll be more than 17. It's basically when I think of one, I just add it to the Twitter thread that's um, pinned on my Twitter, which is at Simon Smith MCR. All right, so number one, establish credibility. Hopefully I've done that a little bit already. That was kind of the point at the start of this presentation uh, where I talked about where I've worked, how long I've been in the games industry and mentioned some of the games I've worked on. That gives you an idea that I've worked in the games industry for a while. If you have that in your career, please talk about that as soon as possible. Where you want to put that in a presentation or an email is up to you. But I suggest quite early on because the sooner you tell me how credible you are and what you've done and what awards you've won and what games you worked on and what companies you've worked for, the more likely I am to get interested in your project and think that you can deliver that project. Because remember, it's not just about ideas, it's about how you can deliver it as well. So yeah, what games have you made? What's your experience? Have you won any awards? Is there anything else you can tell me? Do that quite early on in this process. If you're sending me an email, write, hi, I'm so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. I've done this and this. And I've got this cool new game to show you. Yeah, pretty front and center and don't be shy. In Britain, we can be modest and shy about things. Don't be modest. Tell me what you've done, get me excited, sell yourself. Oh, this is a big one for me. So I have to look for games all the time or we get games sent into the website or someone says, look at this cool game. And then 
I have to contact the developer because that's a cool game and we want to talk about signing your game. I'm trying to find you. Please make it easy as possible to contact you. Sometimes you'll go on a Steam page or on the website and they have no way of contacting them. Like, like literally no way of contacting them whatsoever. At least have a plumbing contact email or contact form or something. Please, for the love of everything, please <laughs> make it easy. Um, yeah, Twitter, Facebook, Discord, if you've got them, put them all on there. Recently, I had to resort to trying to send a DM to this guy via his personal Instagram account. And that was the only way I could find of contacting him. It's just exhausting. Make it easy for me. Don't make it a fight. Don't make it a struggle. Um, some tips. Practice networking. It's always good to be able to speak to people. And I know not everyone's good at this. But at the very least, practice it. Learn techniques online. Learn from books. Just things like, um, you know, a good tip for networking at an event. If you see two people together having a chat, don't be afraid to go up and say to them, oh, um, hi, I'm Simon, or whatever the name is. Because a lot of the time, those two people are trying to find an excuse to split up and go network with someone else. So you can start talking to them, and then one of them could go, oh, great to meet you. I'm going to go off and talk to this person over there. So don't be afraid. People who go to networking events for networking are not there to stand talking to the same person all the way through. So it actually can be helpful if you give people an excuse to go and talk to someone else. And also as well, you can do it in a really polite way as well. So if there's two people and you specifically want to go and speak to someone, you can go up to them and say, oh, hi, um, I'm Simon. I would really like to speak to you in a minute, um, if you don't mind, after you finish chatting. And then you go off and walk off and get a drink or talk to someone else. And then that person that you said you want to speak to knows that you want to speak to them, so they'll come and find you, hopefully. But also, they've got an excuse to you lose, sorry, excuse to lose, excuse to leave that other person. So you're kind of helping them out. So there's little techniques like that that you can learn that can be really helpful. Also, if you hate networking and you're rubbish at it, and you're never going to get any better at it, hire someone else to do it. One of the themes probably I'm going to come back to during this is if you don't know how to do something, hire someone else to do it. If you were a programmer or an artist and you didn't know how to do network programming, you'd hire a network programmer. So why not hire someone to do business development, which leads me on to hire a communicator. So, sorry, Sam, can I just pick up on the last yeah. one? Um, because, um, you know, obviously we're in a time, hopefully we're getting back to doing um, physical events and we've got the Game Republic event um, outdoors at a pub uh, coming up. But um, what about online? You know, how, this is the bit that I think we really miss online. So, you know, it's more difficult to kind of replicate, really. Uh, we can do meetings pretty straightforward, yeah. but networking is quite difficult. So have you, have you any tips to doing it online? Well, you've, you're missing those sort of spontaneous, serendipitous meetings. Mm. Aren't you? And what you're really mm. missing is that you're chatting with someone and then someone else walks past and they're like, oh, come and meet this person and, you know, being introduced to kind of things. So you're just going to have to like try social media and, and recommendations from people and just friends and, st and talk to people and, and communicate with them. And it, it is harder, but I mean, it's easier in some ways because mm. I'm, you know, I mean, my job is speaking to people all over the world. So um, I can, you know, I can, with virtual conferences, I can speak to people really easily. Um, you have some kind of networking systems where you can like walk around and talk to people. Like we did it for a UK event earlier this uh, re earlier this year. There's a Gather Town. Yeah, Gather Town. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I really like Gather Town. Yeah, it's good fun. Have a little avatar. It's quite computer game. You have a little avatar, and then you can walk around and talk to people, and the videos appear. Yeah, and I've done the games industry gathering. Um, yeah, yeah. Which which um, is just an industry gathering um, on Zoom, and you get thrown into these random rooms and things, and that's that's nice as well, you know. But uh, I mean, um, yeah. a, lot, a lot of it at the moment is really just going to have to be recommendations and chatting to people. Yeah. yeah. But if you go on forums and stuff like that and make friends with people, you know, how, you know, how else do you meet people online? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Think of it like dating. How do you meet people online? I was just going to say that. You're going to be swiping left or right. with. Uh... <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how that, I can't even remember which is which. <laughs> well, I'm uh, married, so I have no idea. Oh, you have no idea. You just heard of the concept. I'm just trying to be trendy and keep it with the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, so yeah, so networking, again, if you're not very good at it, hire someone to do it for you. 
don't be afraid to hire people to fill in the gaps of your skills. So you don't have to be the salesperson for your game, but you need someone who is. And that's either whether it's self-published or whether it's working with a publisher or other people or a format holder. You've got to still got to communicate with people. So if you're not very comfortable communicating with people and being like the razzle dazzle salesperson, then hire someone or work with someone. You can hire a marketing company, you can hire a social media influencer company, all this kind of stuff to help you connect with people. Uh, as it says on the screen, have someone with good communication skills. And then again, to reiterate, hire gaps to fill. Uh, hire people to fill in gaps in your skill set. Uh, is the same way you would with a technical person. Why not think of it that way, if that's easier. Um, okay, so before you actually pitch to someone, research who you're pitching. You don't have to do this, but it's quite interesting to kind of like have an idea of who you're speaking to. So um, you can research the company as much as possible. I think that's the basic thing you need to do. So if you're speaking to Team 17, there's quite an extensive Team 17 website. There's Wikipedia pages, there's articles, there's uh, you know things on LinkedIn. And then check out the people you're pitching to in the company culture. So Debbie Beswick, the CEO of Team 17, has been CEO for years and has been a founder member and team member for the whole 31 year period of Team 17. She's very knowledgeable about the games industry and she tweets interesting stuff. So check out her Twitter. You know, before Christmas, she tweeted something about, oh, I wish I'd signed more VR games. That's an interesting piece of information. I mean, Debbie's very careful because it's a public limited company. But when she tweets something like, oh, I wish I'd signed more VR games, that's, that's a bit of a hint <laughs> um, that she's open to this specific genre or format. So, you know, don't be afraid to look on people's things. You can look on my Twitter, see what games I'm into, see what games I'm tweeting about. Um, you know, just the sort of person that you're, if, you know, you're speaking to, and are you on that the same wavelength, or are you interested in similar things? Is that something you could get on with? You don't have to get on with me necessarily, but you, you know, you have to feel like the company is someone that you want to work with. And I, we've all got presence online, social media, and the, and the, you know, the company. Like, if you look at Team Seventeen tweets, you know, it tweets about what sort of company it is as well. So it was doing tweets um, supportive of um, LGBT people in Pride Month last month, you know, tweeting in Black History Month. So you sort of got an idea of, of what matters to the company and it tweets about how they look after the company, uh, the, the team members and stuff like that. So that's a great example. Um, so yeah, understand the desire. So think about who you're pitching to, but also think about what they want. And that, desire might be more than just about making money so pretty much you're going right i want to i'm going to work with a publisher and the publisher wants to make money they don't just want to make money some publishers want um to create jobs or some sorry some funders want to create jobs so say creative england or someone like that they can help fund your projects and help you but creative england is a quasi government agency and their desire is to create jobs and develop the economy of the UK. So they're not just about making money, they're about creating jobs as well. Someone like Sony or Nintendo or Microsoft, they want to do strategic content. So they want games that are going to help sell games consoles. They don't just want games that are going to make money because they make money in lots of different ways. So for example, with PlayStation, I worked on, on the Buzz games uh, at PlayStation, one of the reasons they made the Buzz quiz games was so that they had something that all the family could play uh, and sit around the TV playing games together. And therefore, that made more people want to buy a PlayStation because you could say, hey, I want to buy a PlayStation for the family. We can play all these family games. Um, Prestige is an interesting one as well because some companies want to win BAFTAs. You know, they want to make their company look good. So they will maybe take on your game that's a bit more arty and interesting and not necessarily a super money making game but it can get put forward for a load of awards and make the company look good and make them sell other copies of other games as well so yeah prestige is not to be uh, discounted um this is a real big bugbear of mine as well make it easy to view pitch materials please don't ask me to keep downloading massive two gigabyte videos you don't know what my internet could connections like make it easy for me if you want me to watch a video upload it to youtube and make it unlisted or password protected 
for a developer, this happens quite often, but a developer the other day, they sent me a, um, their pitch was on a web page. It's brilliant. I didn't have to download anything. On a web page that was password protected, great. They've still got the security. They can give me an individual password for my login or for my company to check it out. And I don't have to do anything other than type that password in, which is easy enough. But yeah, I, I hate downloading big videos. It's really annoying. And I've got to store them on my computer and it's just a waste of the internet. Just upload them to YouTube, upload them to Vimeo, send me the link. Put the links in the email that you're sending, click on it. It's a little bit different with Team 17 because we have a submission website where you can just put the links in, but then they get sent through to me and I can just click on them. But yeah, put as, give us as much information as possible, but links are better than making me download stuff. Yeah, and another point there actually I should mention is I want to be able to forward it to colleagues as well. If you send me a two gigabyte video, I'm not going to send a colleague a two gigabyte video with an email attachment. I just want a nice link. You know, the more people that get excited about your game within a company, the better. So make it easy for me to get other people excited as well. Uh, a slight addition to that as well, include version numbers and builds. It's just a simple thing, but we get really confused. And ideally put it on the main menu of the game and also put it in the file name when you send us a build. Because you might be sending us multiple builds or we might have seen your game six months ago and we just want to know it's moved on or it's different or interesting or something's changed. It's a very simple thing to get into the habit of doing and not very difficult to do. You can do it automatically with some setups as well. Uh, number nine, okay, let's just getting more into a deeper dive into stuff to have in a pitch document. So three essential pages for a pitch document. So I want to see three things. These are th three things I absolutely want to see. I obviously want you to tell me how cool your game is and how interesting it is and here's some pretty pictures and some videos and some GIFs and how beautiful the game is and, and what it's going to do and what's interesting about it. But these are the three things I need to see. So what are the unique selling points? What are the exciting, interesting things that make it different from game A, B, C, D and E that's happened in our already? Who are the team and what is their experience? So that's going back to the start of this talk where I was talking about establishing credibility. Tell me who the team are, why I should get excited about them. And then this is a massive one. What do you want from a publisher? What do you want? What, you know, I'm not psychic. <laughs> I don't know what you want unless you tell me. If you tell me that you want a million dollars, fine, just tell me. And don't be afraid to tell me as well. You know, I'm a company, it's a business, I understand these things. If your game is worth funding for a million dollars, then absolutely we'll fund it for a million dollars. But don't be afraid to tell me uh, and put that information in the document that you're sending me as well. If I hear from um, I hear from quite a few um, companies looking for pitches as well. It's like, don't if you've got 20 minutes in an online meeting or whatever, don't spend the first five, 10 minutes talking about the backstory of the game and the characters and the world and everything. <laughs> Well, game, you know, Jamie, games are about gameplay. Mm. I don't want to sound old fashioned, but games are about gameplay. What? What? Well, you know, <laughs> you know, if we want to, if, you know, stories are great, absolutely. And, and stories and emotions and, and mm. character development, absolutely great if, if the game warrants that. But really, games are about gameplay and interaction and how you do things because. If you just want to watch a story and don't interact, then you'll obviously go and watch a film or a TV show or listen to a podcast or a radio drama. Mm. But so gameplay should be first and foremost. I mean, we do get, it's hard to show in a document, but you can show people playing the game and that kind of stuff. Sure. Right, some more tips for uh, actual pitch documents. Oh, uh, so videos. So this is interesting. So I'll just mention this quickly before I play the video. I'm going to play the start of this video and then move on. But one thing that we get at a publisher is we're really busy all the time. You know, we've only got a limited amount of time to watch videos. So if you're making me sit through a three minute video before I see something interesting, then I'm going to get bored. Um, I want to see something quite soon. I don't have time to sit through two and a half minutes of atmosphere to get to 30 seconds of gameplay at the end. Um, and it's not just about marketing to the consumer. This video up here is actually a consumer video, but you need to think about that you're not marketing your game to the consumer. If you're pitching, you're marketing to a potential funder. It's not about selling it and getting people excited and building up some sort of media campaign. It's about getting a publisher or a funding body excited about your game as quickly as possible. So let's just have a look at Recompile from uh, Feet Games, who's based here in Manchester. So this has been getting a lot of interest. Just watch the first 
first 10 seconds and then the first 10 seconds after that. And I'll skip to the next stage. So if you see, you see what Fee did there, he, his video, is, the first 10 seconds is exciting gameplay, gets me, uh, gets me excited. Um, they started doing this a lot with film trailers recently, where it's, you know it's the modern media age where people need to get you need to get people excited quickly. So um, that just happens to work really well when pitching to a publisher. If you can get to the, you don't have to just edit ten seconds of stuff at the start, but it's making me wait minutes until I see some gameplay. Sometimes we just see like loads of like music and characters, art and stuff like. We don't even know what the game is. Where's the game? That should be in the header. Where's the game? I want to see the game. I want to see the gameplay. Um, we, we put some GIFs in here as well, because GIFs are a great example. GIFs are a great shortcut way of showing gameplay. So you've got Sable, you've got Narita Boy, you've got a Recompile there, you've got Overcooked. And they're all getting me excited about the gameplay. So you, GIFs are great. GIFs are really good. You can put them in PowerPoint presentations like we've got now. You can put them in an email. You can put them in a tweet. You send uh, a publisher an email with a tweet in that makes your game look amazing. It can sell the game. You can sell the game in one tweet. Uh, all, all of these four gifts made me want to buy these games. You could literally just send me that GIF and I would be interested. And yeah, I remember the Sable one, uh, particularly top left. You know, I saw that and I just went, wow, that's a, that looks amazing. You know, the, the cell shaded look of it and everything. And all the other amazing games, including the Team of the Team 17 games as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and those as well. That you want to get, uh, that you want to get. But yeah, I mean, Narita Boy is a great example because it just mm. looks cool and interesting and every, it looks great in GIFs. So yeah, so stick a GIF in an email if you're sending it and um, that's a great tip. I don't, I'm not expecting everyone to do this all the time, but it, you know, we're visual people, aren't we? And we're, and we're, we're time poor. Um, okay, number 11, don't assume we know everything. Uh, explain things to a reasonable level. Don't assume we know every acronym. So I was in a, a call with a developer and they were going on about this acronym and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's like some very specific subgenre of game. Uh, that it's like, it was like the fourth level down of subgenre of this game. I'm like, yeah, that's quite, um, that's quite specific. You need to explain that bit to me. It's not like, I might know what it means, but, I might not know what the acronym is. And so don't obscure, we know, uh, sorry, don't assume we know all the obscure games you're referencing as well. We probably will, <laughs> but don't assume anything. I mean, don't assume anything at all, really. But um, yeah, particularly when you're trying to get information across, make sure it's really clear. Um, do some benchmarking. This is great to have, particularly in a pitch document. So just have an idea of, what similar games in a similar genre to what you're pitching, what they've done. And you can try and get that, as much of that information online as possible. You can look at Steam reviews and extrapolate from there. Just do a bit of research, look on the forum, see what people think, um, and put some of that information. It might not be 100% accurate, it doesn't really matter. Part of the point of this is, that last point there, show the publisher you're thinking of the commercial side of the game, um, that you've got a business head, that you've been thinking about it a little bit. And also, it just gives the publisher a start point to think about where, you know, what similar games you're thinking of. And just that extra start point. I mean, we'll ask you this stuff anyway, so you might as well think about putting it in at the start. Um, yeah, this is a good one. Say what you need. I've mentioned this already, but so many people do pitches and don't tell us what they need. If you need money, tell us you need money. Don't be shy. You know, that's our job is to fund games. Uh, tell us how much you need and tell us again tell us genuinely what you need to fund this game so don't try and cut it down because you think it will appeal to a publisher because it's less money because that's not the game that you're pitching that's a lesser game you know tell us what you want what you need in, to fund your game you don't need to include another little point is you don't need to include every little bit that a publisher might do in your budget so for example you don't need to put marketing in a budget you can put it as a separate line if you want to, but your budget and your calculations for making the game are what it costs to make the game, for you to make the game. It's a publisher's job to work out how much it costs to market, 
how much it costs to sell it, uh, how much it costs to make the videos, how much it costs to pay someone to do deals and that kind of stuff. That can be, what you need to concentrate on is how much it costs to make the game. Another important thing as well is if you've got any deals already, if you've done anything, you know, if you've done a deal with some obscure publisher in Taiwan, for, um, a, a very small deal, you know, it affects everything and you need to know that. Um, and of course, what's the development timeline? You don't need to put the exact months, but that is nice if you give us an idea. As I understand, or we understand that we might start development from the point when you get the money and get interest from a publisher. You might start development, full development at that point, so that's fine. You can put the timeline without specific years in, that's okay. And we can count with that. But yeah, don't be shy, tell us what you need. Number 14, adapt to win. It's a bit of a story, really. In illustrations, have a backup plan. Um, always have at least two games to pitch. It's no good going into a publisher, and this also references to do a bit of research as well. It's no good going into a publisher with your racing game and then finding out the publisher go, We don't do racing games, we do first person shooters. So, what are you going to do then? Meeting over, it's a bit embarrassing. So, if you're pitching, you know what, you want to make different kind of games, then have another kind of game as well that you can pitch. It's completely different. Always have that in your in your bag, in your backup plan. Um, I did, um, years ago, I found this out, uh, pitching at GDC for Blitz. We had four games. And that we I would have like an a la carte menu. We'd have four games of like, this is a first person shooter. This is a, a, a platform game. This is that. What are you interested in? And the publishers would just go, oh, I'm interested in that one and that one. And it was great because we had more than one that we could talk about. It didn't waste an easy. Wasting people's time is one of the worst possible things you can do. Um, I put improvise, but don't lie. So this leads me into the story. Um, so if you have it in a meeting and they're like, we're not interested in racing games. And you're like, ah, but are you interested in this kind of game? Because we've also been talking about that. And then just talk about ideas and, and things. And a lot of it can come out of it. So myself in that picture and Mark Hardesty, who is my colleague at Blitz Games, we were pitching a, a game. Well, I think we were just talking to Atari actually about Zappa, which is a game that we were making for them at the time. And Atari, we made loads of games for Atari. Uh, they came in and they were having a meeting with us. And just, it was about a completely different game. And they just sort of like were having a cup of tea and a biscuit and they're saying, oh yeah, well, we've got this like, um, we've got this um, um, uh, license that we want to do a uh, game with. We've got this... Uh, um, license for um, a specific thing. I won't, I won't go into it. And we want to make a game of it. And some developers done it and they've given us a pitch and all that. Right? And we're like, oh, that sounds really interesting. We'd love to make a game of that. And in the middle of this meeting, myself and Mark basically just switched and pitched them a game <laughs> based on the license they'd got. <laughs> Completely not based on anything other than it was just like riffing off each other and making it up as we go along. We weren't, you know, we were just coming up with ideas and talking to them. Oh, wouldn't it be cool if you did this? And, oh, yeah, because I understood the license and blah, blah, blah. And by, by the end of that meeting, we'd got a contract to do a prototype for that game. Uh, and we, I, I'm not saying we stole it off of the developer, but we, because as far as I know, they did a prototype as well. But by the end of that game, we'd got uh, that meeting, we'd got a prototype for a game that we hadn't even existed before. We just pitched it in the meeting. Uh, so yeah, improvise, it's good, adapt, think about how you can do it, uh, be professional, try not to smell, try not, to, if you've got a bad cold, just cancel the meeting, I don't want you sniffling and breathing on me, I mean particularly in these coronavirus times, you know, if you're ill, don't, don't turn into the meeting, just send me an email, we'll sort it out, I'll understand, I'd rather you said, I've got a cold, I don't want to breathe on you in a meeting, and cancel it, and come to the meeting and sit through it and you'll be uh, upset that you're being gross. Um, turn up to meetings on time, be polite, always be polite. One thing interesting that Jamie and I were talking about earlier, don't slag off other people. Don't, just don't do it, it's not worth really it. Really don't do it. It's not worth it. You'll, you'll do it and then in eight years, that person will be the person sat where I am in a decision-making role and they'll remember <laughs> and they won't like it and you don't know who knows other people in that meeting you know you might think oh they'll, they'll never know about this person if you yeah. start 
yeah. railing on them, saying, oh, they were useless and made us do this terrible game. It's like, you know, oh, yeah, well, he's my best mate. He was yeah. best man at my wedding or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's like, you honestly don't know. Yeah, it's a small world and it happens all the time. Yeah. And also, just from a, a nice, being nice to people in general point of view, of view, we're all creative people. We're all in the same industry. We've all got the same struggles. We're all trying to do the same thing, which is to get amazing creative projects made. Just like be nice to people and feel empathetic to them. They're doing the same, you know, most people are doing the same thing as you. So we're all in the same boat, you know, just be nice to people. Um, be memorable. This is another little story from Blitz Games days. So I'll do the short version of this. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> it didn't take too long. I've got a long, long. I can talk about <laughs> it. Uh, so Reservoir Dogs, I heard that SCI, as they were called before they became SCI DOS, had got their license to make games based on the Reservoir Dogs film. I loved the Reservoir Dogs film. It was just when I was at university and all that kind of stuff. So I knew everything about it and seen it like probably 20 times. Um, and I really wanted to make that game. So I messaged them and said, can we pitch for it? We did all the, um, we did all the pitch for it, pitch document, everything like that. I was like, well, I really want to go for it. And I'd heard, pardon me, I'd heard on the great on the grapevine that SCI like quite liked it when people did like interesting pitches and stuff. And quite recently, before we pitched Rise Wild Dogs, someone had pitched Carmageddon to them to do a new Carmageddon game. And I'd heard that they sent the pitch document in a big cardboard box full of uh, fake blood and severed limbs. And so they the SCI people had to like dig through some fake severed limbs to get the to get to the pitch document that was in this box. And that's very on brand for Carmageddon. You might not like it, but it's an 18 rated game with blood and guts. And, you know, <laughs> SCI knew what they were getting into. So um, I was like, oh yeah, well, you know, it'd be fun. We can do something to make us memorable and interesting and to help us get the game. So what we did is um, we uh, went down to pitch to SCI in their office and me, Ian Pestridge in the middle and Philip Oliver on the right, who is the joint founder and owner of uh, Blitz Games, we all dressed up as uh, Reservoir Dogs characters. We dressed up in the black uh, suits and the white sides. We turn up in the sunglasses. We're there at the SCI office. We've got a medical bag with fake diamonds in uh, and a cutthroat razor, like if you've seen the film. I even got a fake ear. So spoilers to the film, but I got a fake <laughs> ear, put blood on it and stuck it on a tile. And I've got a, 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 a severed ear and a, and a cutthroat razor, and that's in as part of the pitch package uh, with the pitch document. And we're delivering that to SCI and we're doing it. Just, just a bit of theatre to get people excited. So, I mean, uh, another good example is um, a guy that came to do an interview at Blitz, and he'll know who he is if he hears this, but I won't mention him by name. Uh, he came to do an interview as a programmer, and he bought donuts with him to the meeting <laughs> and forevermore he's like he was that guy that bought donuts to the meeting <laughs> so everyone like remembers the guy that bought donuts to the meeting he got so the simple <laughs> yeah he got the job just bring food job. bring food yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's really he's really nice it did help that he was very talented experience and really nice guy <laughs> oh yeah yeah but you know just these little things that can help you help you stand out i actually tried to hire a car i tried to hire an american cadillac so we could turn up to the si offices in this car but uh, it was too expensive to get one to uh, docklands in london and we would have done it we would have turned up in the car so we had to go on the tube so that's quite good i wish you got a photo of that but it was sort of before smartphones but there were us three on the tube just as reservoir dogs characters it was quite amusing so yeah be memorable and um uh, it, it does help uh and then just to finish off be patient. Projects can take years. Um, I've been pitching, a, I've been working on a game pitch since, which I first came up with in 2001, and I still want to make it, and I still feel I will make it at some point. I spoke, I've had a few near misses with it, uh, and hope to make that at some point. It's a game that I'm really passionate about, and I think could be really successful, so I won't forget that. Um, also, I mean, this is a bit personal as well, but people have lives outside the jobs, you know, this is one thing that indie developers sometimes don't think about. And we are, you know, as publishers, we are trying to be there for you as much as possible, but we're not, it's, you know, if you work for another company, it's a little bit different. So indie developers, you eat, breathe, sleep your game 24 seven. And, um, you know, 
you, you know, you might, you know, I'm not up at, well, I'll say I'm not up at two o'clock in the morning. I was up at two o'clock in, o'clock in the morning doing a dev call with Australia recently. But, um, you know, you have to remember that people have lives and, um, you know, there's all these things like mental health and all this kind of stuff that you have to be aware that if you're bugging people and sending them a hundred emails every day, and, uh, it can get really stressful. And, uh, you know, we will get back to you. Uh, we have a lot of things to work on. Um, we will absolutely go back to you, but yeah, be aware that people have lives, so be patient with, with people as well. It's okay to send a friendly reminder. I do appreciate that. So if I haven't, you know, you know, just don't send like one every day. Um, it's absolutely okay to send a friendly reminder because it might just drop to the bottom of the email pile for whatever reason, because I said we're all busy all the time, aren't we? Um, so yeah, friendly reminder, friendly DM or whatever. Absolutely great. Yeah, please do that. Won't be offended by it. I just don't want you bugging me every five minutes. <laughs> um, that almost sounded negative in the end. I don't want to sound negative. <laughs> Be patient. Be patient, grasshopper, as he says. In, 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 be patient. It will happen. And actually, Team 17 is an example. Team 17 is super fast at getting back to you. The fastest publisher that I've ever worked with. Um, you know, if you send something into our sub- submission, you'll get you'll hear back within. You should hear back within two weeks, at least in some way. Um, so yeah. So I'll just mention that again. If you want to pitch your game to Team 17, send it in there. You can also meet us at a conference or talk to us when you see us around. Um, the actual best, 100% best way to submit a game is through this web form because it goes directly to the game scouting team. Everyone sees it. It's instantly in the system. And because there's a list of things to fill in that you fill in as the developer, then we know it's correct because you filled in your own information. So there's not something that we can make a mistake on. And we've got all the relevant information that you can fill in on. Uh, so yeah, it's absolutely the best way of pitching to us. It's not the only way of pitching to us, but it's the best way of uh, the number one best way of doing. Fantastic! Thank you, Simon. That was that was awesome. Uh, some really great tips there, and um, obviously we're recording this now, and we're we're going to um, um, launch this in um, on our on our website and on YouTube as well. So um, it's just a great resource. I think um, sometimes um, it can be a bit confusing, a bit daunting, I think, for new games developers thinking about, you know, how they approach companies. But um, some fantastic uh, words there. And um, from a Team 17 point of view, are you are you looking for games all the time? Have you haven't sort of filled up your, your kind of the portfolio time. at the moment? No end. No end. There's no end. <laughs> so how many, games, how many games do you, do you publish a, a year, would you say? Um, I'm, I have to be careful what I say. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's probably best to just look at their historical numbers and yeah, uh, yeah. But you're always you're always going to be looking for games. You, you you fund games as well as you know. Um, yeah. So you as well as kind of obviously paying for things like if they need um, marketing or if they need uh, perhaps a soundtrack and things like that. But you'll also fund fully fund games as well. Yeah, I mean, as a publisher, it's kind of obvious that we're fully fund games. Yeah. We're, from scratch we can do it from we can do things from a paper pitch we can do things from a demo i mean we really like demos because you know we can see how the game works mm, mm, that's mm. great one of the great things about team 17 is we are game developers we make games you know i'm a designer i've worked on loads of games from scratch and we have you know 300 developers at team 17 we're one of the only publishers in the world that has internal developers that can help you publish your game so help you port Mm, and, publish mm. a game and get it onto onto different systems uh we're one of the few places that can do that I think. and yeah. Uh, yeah i was gonna say something else and it just slipped out of my mind carry on <laughs> yeah well no that's fantastic so thank you thank you ever so much for for doing that and um obviously look on twitter it's, it's at team 17 limited i think isn't it for the it's twitter at, and for your at team 17 yeah. and then mine is at simon smith mcr which i should have yeah. put on this page good stuff Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you for coming along today and uh, lovely to see you again. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to meet up uh, when we actually have our event uh, live in, at yeah. the end of this month. So looking yeah, good stuff. Seeing, yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing everyone at the event. I'll be there and um, yeah, have a chat. Good. Come and practice your networking. <laughs> yeah, that's right.
Good idea. Brilliant. Uh, super. Thank you to uh, Simon Smith, their uh, senior game scout at Team 17. And also a big thanks to Simon Ivanisak, uh, CEO of Red Kite Games in Leeds as well, and for sponsoring uh, the event. Uh, that's it for today's um, webinar. So we'll hopefully catch up with you very soon. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye.